the ability to grow underdeveloped roots diagnosed with necrotic pulse. What's the protocol? What's the technique? Stick around. I'm Bill Nudera. Welcome to my channel dedicated to clinical endodontics. This case we're going to look at today, tooth number nine, diagnosed with necrotic pulp, symptomatic apical periodontitis on an 11-year-old who sustained trauma at a very young age. As we look at the PA, tooth number nine shows a classic underdeveloped immature root formation with the wide open apex and the blunderbuss appearance of that root. These are really challenging teeth to treat. We've got young patients, we're working in the aesthetic zone, and we've got now a compromised tooth that is considered to be done growing based on the necrotic nature of the pulp system itself. So how we move forward and how we approach these things is very, very important if we want to establish a good long-term prognosis for this patient. I've got the cone beam scan opened and you can see all four views here. We have axial, coronal, sagittal. I'm gonna pull up the sagittal first. Look at how wide open this apex is. As I move through the scan here, we can clearly see that this root canal system is completely underdeveloped. We have this huge blunderbuss appearance to the apical area here. Looking at the coronal aspect, same thing. How in the world can we expect to retain and contain our obturation material inside a root canal system this wide? Moving down the axial view, we see an extremely large pulp space. These are challenging in so many different ways, especially when the pulp is necrotic. What are our options here moving forward? What can we do with this? In a case that's been diagnosed with necrotic pulp and a wide open apex, the option for an apexogenesis is no longer available since the vitality of that, that pulp is no longer there. Once that pulp is removed, we now need to figure out what our realistic options are in order to give this tooth the best chance of surviving long term. Option one, traditional root canal treatment. Traditional root canal treatment in a situation like this is very challenging for many different reasons. The pulp canal system is so large, removing all that necrotic tissue from inside that tooth is our first challenge. But even more challenging is the ability to obturate this root canal system and provide the seal that's required in order to get that long-term outcome. With a root system as underdeveloped as this, we can see that containing that obturation material with inside that root system is going to be challenging. If we're gonna move forward and consider a traditional endodontic approach, there are two options within that. We can either consider something called a calcium hydroxide apexification, which is requiring multiple steps and replacement of calcium hydroxide for several months, if not a year, for a dentinal bridge to be formed at the apex of the tooth in order to help us contain our obturation material. The other option would be an artificial apexification where some sort of barrier is placed beyond that open apex and a bioceramic material is then packed and condensed at that apical terminus for us then to contain the obturation material with inside those, that tooth. Both these options are realistic options to move forward, but it does nothing to help strengthen the root or sustaining this tooth over a long period of time. With the fact that we have an underdeveloped root with this tooth, it will always have thin walls and always be prone to potential vertical fracture. There's a better option that we have in these scenarios, especially for young children, and that option is something called a revascularization. We actually can grow the root in length and in thickness by introducing some hemopoietic stem cells inside the root canal system to create a mechanism to allow continued root growth in a once thought to be necrotic and impossible situation. The traditional approach to a revascularization is usually done in a two-step protocol. The first step in moving forward is very similar to what you would normally do for any other endodontic treatment. We anesthetize the patient and establish a nice aseptic field. The tooth is accessed, we remove the necrotic pulp, and you can see here what I removed out of this particular tooth. This is the etiology. We've got to get rid of that. It's very important when you're doing this to not instrument the root canal walls. We don't want to touch those root canal walls, number one. They're already thin enough. We don't need to enlarge them anymore. And number two, we're trying to maintain some viable cells that could be left in the odontoblastic layer, which will help in future development of this root 
Once the pulp is removed, we then follow an irrigation protocol. The irrigation protocol must match what we're trying to accomplish with the revascularization. So my irrigation protocol is generally a positive pressure irrigation with a significantly diluted amount of sodium hypochlorite, about 1%, maybe even down to 0.5%. Diluting sodium hypochlorite down to 0.5% will have the same antimicrobial efficacy as full strength, but now we're not using the full strength and not worrying about damaging viable cells with inside that root system, but yet still addressing the etiological variable. You may want to consider putting a file in there to help you determine length. Sometimes if you're working under high power magnification, you could actually see where the apex of that root is. If it's unclear where the apex of that root is, I certainly encourage you to throw in a file so you can establish some sort of working length. Once you've established a clean root canal environment, then you now need to consider an intercanal medicament. At the time of the recording of this video, the intracanal medicament of choice would be calcium hydroxide. You're going to inject calcium hydroxide into the tooth about a millimeter to two short of the working length all the way up into the orifice level of that tooth. This is an image of the calcium hydroxide I placed at the end of visit one. It's not great placement, it's not exactly where I want it, and there are some voids in it. It doesn't mean that the treatment's not going to work, it just means that it doesn't look as aesthetically pleasing as we like it to. Once the calcium hydroxide is in place, it becomes a waiting game. I like to wait for between about four and six weeks before I have that patient back for visit number two. It's really important that we can get symptoms under control. If we take out that necrotic pulp and the swelling remains, the sinus tract remains, and the symptoms remain long after that first visit, we have to consider another option. Visit number two is probably the most critical of the visits themselves. The first thing we do at that second visit is we look and make sure that the symptoms have resolved. We want to make sure the patient's asymptomatic. If you try to move forward with the revascularization and symptoms aren't fully resolved, the predictability of this procedure actually working decreases significantly. The second visit is extremely important, even down to how you anesthetize your patient because the whole process involves bleeding in order to stimulate growth of the remaining cells that could be on the odontoblastic layer. So in order to ensure that we can establish this bleeding inside that root canal system, we want to make sure that when we anesthetize this patient at visit two, that we're using an anesthetic that does not contain epinephrine. So the steps at visit two are as follows. Anesthesia, aseptic isolation, reaccess the tooth, and re-irrigate that root canal system with a 17% concentration of EDTA. You're gonna wanna make sure you remove that calcium hydroxide from that root canal system in its entirety because you don't want remnants of that calcium hydroxide affecting those cells that we're trying to get to grow. You can do this by taking an image just to confirm that there's no remnants of calcium hydroxide remaining. Once you're certain that there's no calcium hydroxide remaining, you now have to institute bleeding with inside that root canal system. So you're gonna take a larger file and you could use it straight, you can put a little bend at the tip and you're going to place it long inside this tooth. When the file is placed beyond the apex in cases like this, you then start damaging the periapical tissues intentionally so you can create a little bit of bleeding at that apical area. You create enough bleeding so that that bleeding begins to fill inside that root canal system to about the level of the CEJ. Sometimes this takes a little bit of time. And remember, you're working generally on younger patients with anesthetic with no epinephrine. So in the past, I've had a couple of patients feel a little bit of discomfort during this part. Although it's rare, it's certainly possible that can happen. Once bleeding has achieved the level of that CEJ, we now need to start planning for the restoration to keep the bleeding with inside that root canal system and form a clot and scaffold for the future development of this root system. We do that by placing a little barrier of collagen membrane. Now, when we place the barrier of collagen membrane, we want to place it just a little bit below the CEJ. It doesn't need to be compacted in there forcefully, but it does need to be placed in there firmly. The collagen over time will resorb on its own and will act as a little bit of a barrier so we can begin building our final restoration. Once that collagen membrane is securely placed a little bit below that CEJ, we then use a bioceramic material in order to create a seal at that CEJ level. 
I chose BC putty here because it's white. Traditionally, other materials like MTA, either gray or white MTA, have caused a little bit of coronal staining in some cases and a lot of coronal staining in others. And remember, we're working in the aesthetic zone. So we've got to choose materials that are consistent with the areas that we're working. The goal is to place the bioceramic material on top of that collagen membrane in a minimum of a three millimeter thickness. Once the bioceramic material is in place, you then want to restore the access with a bonded resin material. In these cases, I encourage you to consider using a dual cured material to eliminate the variable of light penetration to ensure that the material sets up at the depth that we need it to. Once the material is in place and the tooth is restored appropriately, it becomes a waiting game. We have to be patient with these procedures. We can't expect instant root growth. Now, in some cases, I've had the root grow within very short periods of time. Other cases, it's taken upwards of 24, even 36 months before we've seen some significant improvements of root growth and root development. I will routinely put my patients on a six-month follow-up schedule for at least the first year or two to get a good idea of the progress of root development. This is the first follow-up that we did for this patient, and this was at five months. We can already see a change in the root length but the root is still very wide open. So I wouldn't expect to see any root closure at this point, but the fact that I don't see any signs of swelling clinically, the patient is asymptomatic, and there's no apical pathology radiographically, we then continue to observe. This is what the root development looks like at eight months. Not bad. We see some changes here. We see some length in the root, no thickness of the root canal walls yet, but we are seeing the positive changes that we're looking for. At one year, we're now seeing a significant increase of the root thickness, and we're beginning to see the closure of the root in the apical area. At two years, you can see root closure, you can see increased root canal thickness, you can see that the revascularization procedure has been successful. This is what the cone beam scan looks like at two years. We can see full root formation, we see greater root thickness, Moving in the axial direction, we can see the thickness of the root and the amount of tooth structure that we were able to grow. Looking at the sagittal view, we see full root formation and full apical closure with no signs of apical pathology. At three years, you can see that this root has continued to thicken over time, causing the canal system to become thinner indicating that whatever process of regeneration is occurring, it's still going on three years after the treatment. The question now is, if we're seeing that root grow and obliterating that pulp space, should we jump in and provide root canal treatment at this particular point? Well, I take a very conservative stance on this. I say no. Unless there's any signs of apical pathology or any sort of symptoms from the patient, I think it's best just to allow the natural progression and formation of whatever's going to happen. If we need to do something in the future, we have those options. But right now, I think it's too aggressive. The clinical outcome is just as important as the radiographic outcome. We don't want to see any discolorations to the tooth. And you can see the three-year image of this tooth shows that the tooth looks just like the neighboring tooth next door without any change in the hue or color of this tooth. So in my opinion, we've achieved the outcome that we want to. Revascularization procedures are wonderful conservative options to offer our young patients because of their potential to heal and regenerate root structure that was once thought to be impossible. It's very exciting to see these things happen. The parents are happy, I'm happy, and it's nice when these things go as planned. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my video presentation today. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you can see future videos. I'm Bill Ludera. Thanks for watching.